All right, so tonight is going to be more of a, a doctrinal sermon. So I'll give you guys a break from hitting you over the head with the Bible. Uh, and you know, hopefully you haven't forgotten about last week's sermon. You know, well, last week's sermon was very important that we continue to grow. But today I wanted to preach. Uh, you know, Pete might be thinking I'm preaching on this because he asked the question. I was actually thinking of preaching on this topic because I haven't yet. And Pete just happened to ask the question in the Facebook group. So it's good you're dialing in, Pete, because then at least uh, I'm sure you'll get a lot out of this in terms of dealing with the topic of speaking with tongues. Now, when we talk about speaking with tongues, you know, there's one denomination really that everyone thinks about, and that's the Pentecostal church. Now, if you didn't know, there are, there are different types of Pentecostals. There's like liberal Pentecostals, which are like don't use the King James Bible and you know, more casually dress, have rock music and you know, a bit more crazy and things like that. Um, but then you also have, if you didn't know, you also have fundamental Pentecostals too. I, I think they're called fu fundamental Pentecostals or reformed Pentecostals. And you have Pentecostals that are like King James only, formal, you know, a cappella singing, that sort of thing. So... Uh, there's different types of Pentecostals out there, if you didn't know. So it's not always Pentecostals just think of Hillsong, because there is also Reformed Pentecostals. And, and what I find that is usually an error with Reformed Pentecostals is the speaking in tongues is one of them, what they believe about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the other thing is a lot of them believe you can lose your salvation because they're Armenian in theology, so they believe that you, know, you can actually use your free will to walk away from the faith. That's just my experience with a lot of these fundamental or Reformed Pentecostals. But I haven't preached on this topic before. For those of you who know me, obviously, you know our position is that we don't believe uh, in the speaking in tongues movement that you see in the charismatic church. I personally don't even believe the gift of the Holy Ghost of speaking in tongues is even applicable to today. I believe it. My, my persuasion is, is that it has ceased and that's why we don't see it. And what you see today is either just fake fakery, you know, it's either fake or in some instances, it's satanic, right? Because it's not only the Pentecostals that you see, you know, talking in this gibberish and saying that it's speaking with tongues. There are other sort of pagan cultures and, you know, in Africa and stuff that do the same sort of thing. Even Mormons, I think, to a certain extent. If, I, if I'm remembering off the top of my head, uh, I remember that even Mormons believe, uh, you know, when you, when you read on, on the Mormon website and speaking uh, in tongues, what the Bible calls speaking with tongues. So hopefully this sermon, it's going to be more doctrinal. I'm going, to go, I'm going to go through a lot of scripture. I'm going to try and get through it as quick as I can. All the applicable verses, I think, that apply to this topic. And it'll give you an understanding, you know, why we don't speak with tongues at this church. Like, you don't come to the church in punch bowl and Victor's getting you all to stand up, you know, and swing in my jacket and slapping you on the forehead and then you guys are falling over and, you know, giggling and speaking in tongues and saying all this gibberish. I've, I don't know, has anyone here ever been to one of those things? I mean, I know obviously Ashton has been to them. Has anyone else ever been to one of those Pentecostal crusades where they get the guest preacher to come in, you know, and then he, like, you know, he's doing his Benny Hinn thing, and then, because when you see it on YouTube, you see it on TV, it just, it just seems like, oh, everyone's getting hit by the Holy Ghost, right? But I remember I was at one in Perth, it's probably the biggest Pentecostal charismatic church in Perth. I think it's called uh, Christian... CLCC, I think it was Christian Life, oh, P, PCLC, Perth Christian Life Centre. Right, so that was a charismatic church. They had one of those guest preachers come down. But see, what you don't see on the TV is all the people that aren't falling over. Because right? I'm like watching this guy like going down and probably you know, maybe two out of every three people are just not falling over. I don't know if that's the same experience that Ashton has. Maybe more people falling down in churches he's gone to. But when I, that was the only one I've been to. So I'm just talking from my experience. But he was going down and he was telling some people would be going on the ground, but then you'd see others just get hit and they're just like, something meant to happen? <laughs> Nothing happened. But then he just continues, right? <laughs> so, you know. So let's, let's jump into it because otherwise I, I won't get through all these verses. But I'm, I, I'll just give you a summary of what I'm going to go through, right? The first topic we're going to talk about is what are tongues in the Bible? Number two is why I believe tongues has ceased my reasoning for why I believe they've ceased. And I think there are bad arguments to make for why they've ceased. And I'll give you what I think is a stronger argument or why I take the position that the gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased. And the last one, it will just look at the two main passages in the Bible in regards to tongues. And that's going to be Acts 2 and 1 Corinthians 14. 
And I want to show you in that section why I, I know that what we see today that is practiced as tongues is not biblical, is not of God, because it's not even practiced in the way that the Bible tells us that tongues should be practiced, if tongues were to exist. All right, so what are tongues? So obviously the, the word tongue in the Bible can mean the actual body part as well, right? So when we talk about speaking with tongues, we're not just saying just speaking with your, the, your physical member. But James 3 says, even so, the tongue is a little member, right? a member of the body, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. What's the Bible saying here? And, and, and Nate did a great sermon on this, just the power of the tongue, right? The words that we speak, bridling our tongue. Because the Bible saying, like, your tongue is such a small part of your body. And we think about how big this body part is. It's so small, yet it causes so much trouble, doesn't it? It causes so much strife and conflict. And, you know, words are such a powerful thing. And especially in the day and age we live in, where there's social media and technology and communication, words are almost more powerful uh, than even weaponry. You know, like one tweet from Donald Trump, for example, can just kick up a frenzy, kind of, because words are a powerful thing. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. So obviously in the Bible, tongues can mean the physical tongue. But what we're talking about when we talk about tongues is a language, isn't it? Because you think about your mother tongue. And we see this in the Bible, the way it's used. Whereas people will assume when they think of tongues, they, they, if they're familiar with the Pentecostal church or with this whole speaking in tongues movement in these churches, they just think every time they see tongues in the Bible, it must just be people speaking with this angelic language or this gibberish that we don't know what they're saying. No, no, the Bible just, and the Bible actually we'll see in Acts 2 later on, just interchangeably uses tongues and language because that's what a tongue is when it's not talking about the member. It's just your language, like your mother tongue. Revelation 7, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, look at this, of all nations and kindreds and people, and tongues, right? So different people of different languages stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And here we even see, like we talk about the mother tongue, the Bible even talks uh, in this language when it talks about speaking in a language of a tongue. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is... Uh, in the Hebrew tongue, right? So it's not this Hebrew angelic language or this Hebrew gibberish, right? It's the Hebrew language is a bad one, but in the Greek tongue had uh, this name Apollyon. So you see, tongue just is synonymous with language. So where do people get this idea of an angelic language, right? So if you're familiar with the Pentecostal movement, there's this idea that well, it's because we, 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 they're in the Bible, it's not just different languages of, you know, African, you know, Spanish and all these different languages all over the world. No, there's actually this angelic tongue that we can speak in. And there's a reason why we speak in this angelic tongue. And that's why it just seems so different because it's not an earthly language. Where do they get this idea from? Well, the, where, where they get this idea from of an angelic tongue is 1 Corinthians 13. This is where it, where it is. I don't know of any other place, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, any other place that alludes to an, an angelic language. Right? So what is Paul writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost? He says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. So people say, see, Paul spake not only in different languages, but he also spake in this angelic language. Right? So see how believers are able to speak in this angel. This is the argument, right? This is not what I believe. So don't, don't stop listening there. <laughs> he says, And have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Now, if you just stop reading there, you may get the idea that there is an angelic language that believers speak, right? And that we, you know, are, you know uh, we're exhorted. I guess he's saying here this idea that Paul speaks in this angelic language. So how do you answer this? 
Well, because you don't stop there, right? You've got to understand what Paul is actually saying in these couple of verses. And we'll read verse 2 and we'll read verse 3. And I'll show you that, you know, Paul here is not saying things that he actually does, right? He's just saying, even though, just means even if I did, right? Because look, and though I have the gift of prophecy, you can say, well, I guess he kind of has the gift of prophecy. But look at this, and understand all mysteries, I mean, did Paul, just, did Paul just have a perfect knowledge of all mysteries? No? And all knowledge? I mean, did Paul just know absolutely everything there was in the whole world? He didn't have all knowledge, right? And though I have all faiths so that I could remove mountains? So what is he talking about? Have not charity. I am nothing. Verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Now, did Paul do that? I'm sure he was very charitable, but he still had goods, right? He didn't sell everything that he had to give to the poor, right? And look at this last one. And though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So you see how Paul is not saying here that he did these things. The point of 1 Corinthians 13, which is the chapter of charity, is saying even if I did these things, even if I had all knowledge, which I don't, even if I, you know, I uh, gave my body to be burned, which I don't, which I didn't, which he didn't, right? And he's saying, hey, even if I could speak in an angelic language. He says, if I don't have charity, it doesn't mean anything. It's nothing. That's his point, right? So it's not he's saying he actually does these things. He's just saying, if he did, which he doesn't, he didn't, uh, he would be nothing if he didn't have charity. And that's what the, the rest of the chapter is about, like about charity and things like that. So, this passage is not teaching that Paul spoke in an angelic language, right? And that's what these Pentecostal charismatics think. They think, well, I speak in this angelic language, and they come up with reasons why they need to speak in this angelic language. You know, either it's they think it proves that they're saved, right? That's one thing. You know, if, um, if you're saved, then you'll speak in tongues. Another thing is they'll just say it just makes, I've heard, these are the sort of reasons that I've heard, right? They'll say, well, it just makes me feel good, you know, when it, you know, they're, they're in this trance and they're just praying and it just gives them this feeling. Uh, and I, I used to say to that, yeah, well, you know, if some people drink coffee and it gives them a good feeling, but you know, it doesn't mean that God's come out. It doesn't mean you proves you're saved or it's something spiritual, right? It's just, it's just a feeling. Another one they say is, um, and I don't know if I'll touch on this later, but another one they say is, well, I don't want Satan understanding my prayers so that's why I gotta preach, I gotta I gotta pray in this language that nobody understands. Not even I understand, the Holy Spirit understands, because I don't want like Satan to like intercept those prayers and know what I'm praying. But is anyone is anyone really scared that if Satan knows what we're praying? I mean, I, I I'm glad if he if he could, you know, if you're saying it out loud and he happens to be around, he could he could hear your prayers. But did you know Satan can't read your mind? He's not God. You know, only God can read the mind, but Satan can't. Satan's a creature. He understands the human nature. He knows how to manipulate, right? And he knows how to sway things because he understands he's very wise. But that doesn't mean he's omniscient. He doesn't know all things. He can't read minds. He doesn't know. He's not even omnipresent. So when you think Satan made me do something, you know, do you think you're so dangerous to the cause of Christ that Satan you know, personally pays you a visit just to tempt you to watch pornography? You know, like people say, like, they're watching pornography, they're like, oh, Satan tempted me. No, no, that's just your own lust. You know, Satan's not there turning your computer on, going to that website and watching porn, right? So, you know, we don't want to think so highly of ourselves that we're always personally getting attacked by Satan. You know, surely there are demons out there, but, you know, Satan is only one creature. He's only in one place at one time. Uh, so, um, I'm not... I'm not worried at all if Satan hears what I'm praying. You know, and in fact, you know, he probably is more trembling if he knew that Christians were praying to God because we're in a spiritual war and that's one of our weapons as Christians is that we are praying. But that's something they say. They'll say I've heard them say that all the time. It's, you know, I don't want Satan in intercepting, knowing what I'm praying. The problem is you don't know what you're praying either. Right? So Satan, Satan doesn't know what you're praying. Probably he doesn't even know what you're praying, right? Because you think you're the one, it's the Pentecostal that thinks they're praying in an angelic language and Satan's probably just thinking, well, I don't know what the hell you're saying. Because you know, it's, it's, not, it's not an angelic language. It's just gibberish. Um, 
And I'm sure if you speak to Ashton about it, you know, he probably has a lot more experience coming from a charismatic background. I personally don't, but I have heard uh, like testimonies from people that used to be in, in the charismatic movement. And when, when you ask them, like, well, you know, what were you doing when you speak in tongues? And the person that I spoke to was just saying, he used to start saying these things and then eventually just, he just I don't know, it's, it's just so weird. It's, it's like they, they were trying, that person I knew was trying to put it on. Whereas, uh, you know, obviously I've heard stories of people just blacking out and things like that, not knowing what's going on. That's where I think it's, it's, it's likely satanic unless they're under some other influence that we don't know about. Uh, okay, so um, where did I go? Did I, did I uh, skip something? What was I talking about now? Let's go to Romans 8. So there's no, there's no angelic language. Oh, that's what I was talking about, right? So uh, that's, that's where we get the angelic language from. The other thing I, I just want you to, to mention here, uh, to note here, is people that say, oh, you know, it's the Holy Spirit just speaking on my behalf. It's not them speaking when they speak in tongues. That's, that's the, the Spirit interceding and just speaking for me. It's making intercession for me. This is the verse they get it from, verse 8, 26. It says, likewise, the Spirit also help with our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray, uh, what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. So that's another reason they'll say, this is why I speak in tongues, because sometimes I don't know what I should pray for, and if I just, you know, let the Spirit take over and the Spirit just starts making me say these things, it's making intercession for me because I don't know what to pray, but the Spirit's speaking on my behalf and praying for me. And that's what they think this passage is teaching. But what's what's silly about that is that this verse is saying yeah the spirit itself maketh intercession for us look at this with groanings which cannot be uttered but somebody that speaks in tongues and thinks they're praying in tongues they're doing the exact opposite because it can be uttered because what are they doing they're uttering them <laughs> do you see so it's not saying that the spirit is making intercession for you and, and therefore, you are then going to speak in this angelic language. What this is saying is, is when you pray, sometimes you don't always pray according to God's will. Sometimes you don't pray for the right things. And, you know, we have an in intercessor for us, the Holy Spirit, that actually, you know, if you pray the wrong thing, kind of intercedes, or you don't know what to pray for, he'll, like, change that prayer and, and make it pleasing to God, you know, in the Spirit. So that's what, what this is saying. See, the Spirit... Likewise, the Spirit also help with our infirmities, right, our weaknesses, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. See, so we don't know what to pray. We don't always pray the right way. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So we don't know what is being said because these things can't be said, the intercession that the Spirit is making on our behalf. So that's what tongues are. Tongues can either be the physical member, it's a language, it's not this idea of this angelic language. And they get that from 1 Corinthians 13, and I believe it's just a complete misunderstanding of what Paul is actually talking about in 1 Corinthians 13 when he's just saying, hey, I'm doing things. If I did these things and I have not charity, I become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Now, have tongues ceased? Now, there is a, there is a difference of opinion here even amongst non-charismatic people, non-Pentecostal people, on whether the gift of tongues still applies today. Meaning, are there people today that still have this supernatural gift to be able to speak in another language? Because somebody might say, well, okay, granted that it's not an angelic language, but they say, but it's still possible for today for somebody to just supernaturally pick up another language. Now, what I would say is, yeah, I don't discount the fact that miracles still happen. You know, like if something's just miraculous, you know, and, and God for some reason sees it fit to perform a miracle or give somebody something that they couldn't do before, um, you know, is that possible? Yeah, I don't, I'm not going to rule out the possibility of something like that happening. Same with visions or just anything that supernatural can happen, healing even. But the gifts that are passed down by the laying on of hands, as we read in the Bible, when we read about the gifts of the Spirit, these are just not things that just supernaturally happen in pockets, right? These are things that are actually passed down. Firstly, from the apostles, you know, when they laid their hands on people and then they spake with tongues, that's what we see in Acts. I don't believe that continued to get passed down, and I'll show you why. Now, first of all, I'll start with 
what is a poor argument, what I believe is a poor argument for the cessation of tongues, that tongues have ceased and the spiritual gifts have ceased. Because this is how most Baptists that I know would argue the point of have spiritual gifts ceased. And they would go to 1 Corinthians 13. And, and how they would argue it is they'll, they'll go from verse 8, they'll say, charity never faileth. And this is the same chapter we were talking about you know, at the beginning where he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. So it's the same charity chapter, verse 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Right? So there's, it's talking about there's a time where there are these things that are given, prophecies, but they'll no longer be required. Right? They'll cease. They'll fail. Not that, not that the prophecies will be wrong. It's saying that they'll no longer be around. They'll no longer be needed. Right? Look at this. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Right? For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So the bad argument, I think, for the cessation of tongues and spiritual gifts is when they say, you see how, how they'll argument, argue it, they'll say, see, there's tongues and there's gift of prophecies and, and knowledge and you know, they would say, hey, these are the gifts of the Spirit. But then they say, well, but when that which is perfect is come, these things shall be done away. So what we know from this passage is something is coming that's perfect, right? And when that thing that is perfect is come, then these things like prophecies, tongues, they're going to fail, they're going to cease, right? The question is, what is that which is perfect is come? Well, the way they would argue it is, what's the word of God? So they'll say, hey, now that the Bible has come, you know, we don't need additional things. Now, I, I agree with that sentiment. I just don't think this verse is clear enough that you can assume that that which is perfect is come is talking about the King James Bible, right? Or talking about Scripture, right? The, the compilation of Scripture coming together and saying we have, because what they'll say is we have the finalized canon, and now that we have the finalized canon, there's no longer a need for tongues or prophecies and this knowledge, so that's why it ceased. And that's how they argue it. And then they'll say, hey, this is the verse that says that which is perfect is come, and that which is in part shall be done away. So one is the one reason why I think it's a, a weak argument is because it doesn't say necessarily there that the canon of Scripture is come and therefore it's done away. It's something that is perfect. Secondly, when we read on, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. So that's the whole idea of something maturing, something perfect coming, imperfect thing ceasing, uh, which is being a child, obviously. Verse 12, this is why I don't think it's talking about the scripture. I think what that which is perfect is come, everything ceases, is talking about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we actually see Jesus face to face. Why? For now we see through a glass darkly. We don't know everything that's going to happen because we look through the eyes of the scripture. We don't have a clear vision of what is actually going to occur when Jesus returns back. We're given, obviously, some information in the Bible, but we don't know perfectly. But look at this. But then face to face. Right? So I think there is a time when we actually meet Jesus face to face and that which is perfect is come. And now we have perfect knowledge at that point because we'll be resurrected. Right? We have a perfect knowledge of these things and there's no longer a need for these tongues and these prophecies that are in part. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. But now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. So that I think is the bad argument, uh, well, the weaker argument for why tongues have ceased. Now I touched on this, the reason why I think they've ceased in the laying out of hands. I'll just give you a few more verses. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I want to go to 1 Corinthians 14. But in Acts 8, if you remember, we'll read through this quickly. Now, when the apostles which are at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. So uh, <clears throat> uh, Philip is already down there preaching the gospel in Samaria, right? And, and he's uh, you know, performing miracles and doing all this stuff. They get baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus while they're there after they're saved. Now, what it says in verse 15, "...who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost." For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So what I think we see here in Acts 8, if you go back and listen to my sermon laying out of hands, is I believe that it was only the apostles that were given the power to pass on these gifts. Because if you think about it, um, 
Philip did miracles in Samaria, but Simon the sorcerer that followed him, it wasn't until the apostles got here, verse 17, then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon, this is Simon the sorcerer, saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered the money, saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. So Simon was saved through Philip's preaching, and Philip did a lot of miracles. But why didn't Philip lay his hands on Simon? You know, why? Because surely if it was just the apostles laid their hands on people and those people that received those gifts could lay their hands on other people and continue that giving, why wasn't Philip doing that already? Why did he need to call, um, it was, what was it, Peter and John, right? Peter and John in verse 14. Why did they have to, why did the apostles have to send Peter and John down in order for them to receive the Holy Ghost? If, if Philip could just be down there giving them the Holy Ghost and giving them these gifts. So I believe the insight we get here is that it's because he couldn't. And that's what was different when Simon the sorcerer saw Peter and John come. They laid their hands on them. They received the Holy Ghost. Maybe they spake with tongues or they, it was healing and all this other stuff that they didn't have before that Philip didn't give them. And then he wanted that power. He wanted to be able to lay his hands on somebody and give them the Holy Ghost. But, you know, and Peter says, hey, you're not, you're not even going to have a part in this. I don't even think Simon ended up getting a gift from the apostles, let alone having the power to give that gift. So this is why I think it ceased and why we don't see it anymore. I believe it's because it was only something the apostles could do. It's something special about the laying on of the apostles' hands. And we don't have apostles anymore. Right? The apostles came first, secondarily prophets, and then we've got pastors and teachers and evangelists now. So now we're at a time where we don't, I don't even believe we have prophets anymore because I think there was prophets back then. Uh, and now we just have pastors and teachers in the church and evangelists, right? People that go and preach the gospel. So we live in a different time now. Uh, so that's why I think it sees. Um, also, I think there is evidence in the Bible of the gifts no longer being used. Right? What do I mean by that? Well, we read in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, it says, drink no longer water. This is Paul writing to Timothy. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Now, if Timothy was sick, why didn't somebody just lay his hands on them and just heal him? I mean, you read in Acts, there's people getting healed all the time. But because I, I, I think, this is what I believe. Obviously, this is, this is my opinion. You do your own study on this. But what I think what we're seeing in the Bible here is we're seeing these gifts starting to cease, right? They're starting to go away. That's why there are people sick in the Bible and they're not getting healed, right? If the people had the gift of healing, why aren't these people getting healed? Because I think this is later on in the ministry and it's starting to go away. Why? Because the initial reason for these gifts to be given so that the word of God could be preached. And now that the word of God is becoming established, we see it going away. So that's why I'm not completely adverse to the argument that tongues and prophecies cease as the word of God becomes established because that's what I believe that they were given for. And we see that. I just don't think 1 Corinthians 13 is clear enough to say that's just exactly what it says. But I have no problem with that theory, right? To say this is why I think it ceased and this is why I don't think we see it anymore. 2 Timothy 4, look at what Paul writes here. Salute Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at my Letum sick. Right? So if Paul knew somebody that was sick, why didn't he just heal him? That's because, uh, you know, possibly at this time, the gift was no longer around, you know? Um, that's, what I'm, that's what I think. All right, let's look at tongues in Scripture. So we're going to look at the two main passages of tongues. We're going to look at Acts 2, and then we're going to finish with 1 Corinthians 14. So why do I strongly believe that even what we see today that is practiced as speaking with tongues is not what the Bible is describing. Well, it's because the way it is practiced today goes completely against what we see in the Bible when tongues was in use, when we see tongues in Scripture. So let's first look at Acts 2. This is when the gift of tongues was given, on the day of Pentecost. This is where they get their name from, the Pentecostal church comes from Acts 2. Acts 2, is like, that's like their chapter. You know, you could say like, you know, maybe ours is like Ephesians or, you know, Romans or something. Maybe ours is Romans, right? Because it's like the Romans road. That's what soul winners would be known for. 
but a Pentecostal church is known for the day of Pentecost because it's say hey, that's when the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they spake with tongues of fire. And that's why, you know, when you come to church, we're going shabba la ba la ba loo. You know, that's, that's how they sort of justify it. But let's see what we actually see in uh, Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. I, I just underline this because I don't know why, but I've always read this passage as they were praying in that upper room and then just wind just like, you know, you can imagine just like you know, things flying off the walls. And... But it says it's a, there's just a sound like a rushing mighty wind. So there wasn't actually wind in the room. And sometimes people think when they get saved that it's, you know, salvation is just a decision. Sometimes I say this to people where, you know, when you get saved, you're just deciding, you just believe on Jesus Christ. It's, it's, a, it's a sober decision that you make to believe on Jesus Christ and you accept him. It's not always this just great emotional thing that happens. Sometimes people think, that's what I thought, right? I thought, when I called upon the Lord to be saved, you sort of like, just wait, like, yeah. something, something, is there, is there going to be like this wind that's like, shh, like in the movies, where it's like, shh, it's like, oh, like I'm a new man. You know? No, no. It's just the decision you make, right? Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But some people think your salvation experience needs to be like this, right? Like you're praying in the upper room and then there's a the sound of a mushy, rushing mighty wind and it's like, oh, and everyone's born again and they never sinned again. They were changed from that time forward. And you know, everything was just on the up and up. No. Verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. So there was a noise in the room, right? But there wasn't actually a wind. So, anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you because I've always read that the wrong way. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. I mean, I don't know what they look like, but cloven means it's split like a cloven hoof. So it's like there's these tongues that appear, and I guess it's kind of like a snake tongue, right? If you think it's a cloven tongue, it's a fire. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. So they, didn't, they weren't actually made of fire. It was actually a tongue, right? That, that, was, that was like maybe moving like fire, right? And it sat upon each of them, right? And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So remember before when we read the groanings which cannot be uttered? Well, these are tongues that are uttered, right? Gave, the Spirit gave them utterance. So they can't use the verse in Romans 8 saying, hey, with, the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered when when the gifts of tongues was given in Acts 2, the Spirit gave them utterance, right? As the Spirit gave them utterance. So now they're praying in this upper room, the day of Pentecost. Now they're going out to preach the gospel, right? And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard, look at this, heard them speak in his own language. Now, are they going out on the day of Pentecost and just going, you know, you hear people speaking in tongues? No, right? Because they're going out, they're given this gift of tongues, they speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, then they go out and preach the gospel, and the unbelievers listening to them, what do they say? They don't say, what are you talking about, right? Are you, are you, you've been taking drugs, or are you crazy? No, no, they say, well, I'm actually hearing this person that doesn't speak my language, speaking my language. And that's why it's interesting here in Acts 2, in their very chapter, the Bible is saying that the tongue is a, is a language, right? Heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? What are they saying? They're saying, hey, these people are not, like if you're a Chinese person, for example, and you're there on the day of Pentecost, you're saying, these guys are Galileans, but how come I'm hearing them speak Mandarin, you know, for example? How hear we every man, look at this, in our own tongue wherein we were born. See how we know tongues is a language? Because it's interchanged. We speak with tongues, we hear every man in our own language. How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? And then not only that, in verse 9, the Bible then lists off a whole bunch of languages. So it's not like we're wondering what languages they're speaking. We're not wondering they speak with tongues. Could it be angelic languages that I didn't know? 
No, because the Bible then goes on to list Parthians, Medes. These are nations like we read in Revelation. Nations, kindreds, tongues, right? Parthians, Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and in Cappadocia and, and Pontus and Asia. So maybe there was some Mandarin speaking going on there. Phrygia, Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Right, so unless there were angels, yes, then we don't get any mention of angels there dwelling in Pentecost at the time. Angels saying, oh, they're speaking in our tongues. You know, we don't preach the gospel to angels, right? So here, they're preaching the gospel to people. We're given the languages. It's not some angelic language, and it's not at church either. Here in Acts 2, they're not preaching in tongues at church and just praying. Everyone's praying in different tongues. The preacher's like preaching and then he just starts praying in tongues, you know. This is at the day of Pentecost. This is out when they're out preaching the gospel because the whole reason why the gift of tongues was given was so, that, so they could preach God's word to people in a language that they didn't speak. That's the whole idea of it, right? The signs followed them, confirming the word with signs following uh, the gospel of Mark says. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine, right? They're drunk. <clears throat> uh, so that's the first one. Now we go on to 1 Corinthians 14. So I, I, didn't, I didn't read, you, you can go back if you want to read the rest of uh, Acts 2 and, and see how Peter then says, Hey, these aren't people aren't drunk as you suppose, right? And he's saying, Hey, they are um, fulfilling a prophecy that the Spirit would be poured out on them. That's why people can hear them. Because the people that are accusing them of being drunk, just to address this objection, people say like, oh, see, when you speak in tongues, it's like you're drunk. And they'll say, that's why it looks crazy. No, no, because it's the Jews that didn't understand. Because it's the Jews that Peter ends up talking to. So it's the Jews seeing Jews speak Chinese. They're like, is this guy drunk? But the, the Chinese is not given so that that Jew would understand, right? Because the Jews could already hear it um, in, in Hebrew. Or the Greeks could already hear it in Greek. They're speaking Greek, but they had to speak another language that they didn't speak. And if you saw somebody all of a sudden, you know, never speak, you know, it's like if you look at Lewis and then all of a sudden he just starts speaking Swahili, you're going to be like, you drunk, Lewis? <laughs> it's kind of like that. All right, let's go on to 1 Corinthians 14. So I'm going, to go, I'm going to go through this chapter and then that's where we're going to finish to give you an idea of how much we got left. 1 Corinthians 14. So this is the other reason. So we already see in Acts 2 when tongues came about that it's nothing like you see in the Pentecostal church. Right? Because the tongues are given so that they can preach the gospel. And the person that, that is listening to that person speaking in tongues, the reason why that person is speaking in tongues is so that somebody can hear that gospel. And he's like surprised because he's like, I understand what this person's saying, even though he doesn't actually speak my language. Or he didn't speak my language before. 1 Corinthians 14. Now, what is 1 Corinthians 14 about? It's a chapter that Paul is writing to the Corinthian church because there were people in the Corinthian church with the gift of tongues and they were misusing them. So it shows that this gift of tongues is not something that you just like have to sort of channel like your inner being and then it just like comes out like in a bubbling froth of you know, stuff you can't control. No, no, what we read here is that these people had this gift of tongues and they knew they had the gift of tongues. They were blessed with this gift through the laying on of hands and they were abusing it. Right? They were not using it correctly and they were using it to lift themselves up instead of using it for what it was given for, which is either for the edification of the church or for preaching the gospel to people that did not, that spoke the language that they could speak. Follow after charity. So we're following on from 1 Corinthians 13, which was the charity chapter. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So what Paul is saying here, he's saying, yeah, it's fine to want a spiritual gift, but even more important than a spiritual gift is that you prophesy. Prophesy is like teaching. Because why? For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. Why? Because in the church, because the whole idea of the unknown tongue is to go speak to people that don't understand your language, right? But you're speaking in a church that doesn't understand the tongue you've been given, then when you speak with this unknown tongue in church that nobody understands, you're obviously not talking to the church. 
You're obviously not talking to people in the church that don't understand you. This is what it's saying. You're not speaking unto men, but you're just speaking to God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. A mystery meaning nobody, nobody knows, right? Besides God and him, because he's speaking it. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So he's saying, hey, but if you teach the church, then people can learn from it. People can be edified by it. Edified means that you're built up by it. You're strengthened by it. You're comforted by it. So edification, exhortation. Exhortation is like encouraging you to do right. And you're comforted where you learn something. Like maybe it's a sermon about suffering. And you learn from the Bible and you're like, man, that helps me. That comforts me. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue, look at this, edifieth himself. See, if you speak in the church in an unknown tongue, now, is this what Pentecostals are doing? No. Right? So, because obviously, Paul is saying, here, you don't want to go to church and you just go there to edify yourself speaking in a language that nobody understands. That's what 1 Corinthians 14 is about. But yet, you have the Pentecostal charismatic movement going to church in God's assembly. You know, hopefully there's some say people there speaking in an unknown tongue. And the Bible's saying here, you're not edifying the church, you're not doing any good. All you're doing is edifying yourself. If that, you know, if it even, well, assuming it was a legitimate tongue, right? But if it's not, then it's just, you know, it's even worse, right? It could be, it's either fake or it's satanic. I would, so he says, I want, I want, I would as in like I will, I want, I would that ye all spake with tongues. So Paul is saying, hey, it's not that I don't want you all to be able to speak in tongues, right? Like it's because he wants as many people to have the gift of the Holy Ghost as possible. But he says, but more important than that, but rather that ye prophesied. Why? For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. But look at this. Except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So you see how he's saying here, hey, it's great if you want to be able to speak in a tongue, but if you do, if you speak with a tongue, it's only, it only benefits if you interpret what's being said so that the church can actually receive edifying. Now, how many Pentecostal churches, if you've ever been to one, is there ever an interpreter? Where somebody's, because, because everyone's just talking in tongues. Sometimes, sometimes you see preachers on YouTube, they're just walking, they're preaching, then all of a sudden they just break into tongues, and then they go back and then they're talking in English again. You know, that, what's the point of that? The Bible's saying here, no, it's better that you just speak with a tongue that's known, that people can understand, rather than just speaking in an unknown language. Unless you're going to have somebody e interpret it so that you can understand what's being said. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? So Paul's saying here, if I just come to you, because Paul could speak in tongues too. He could speak with, with tongues. So he's saying, what's the point of me coming to speak with tongues? What is it going to profit you? Unless he's saying, I'd only profit you if I come and give you a revelation, give you like some knowledge, some prophesying or some doctrine. right? Not just the fact I just come speaking in another language. And he says, and now he compares it to other things, saying that there's some distinction in the sounds. And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harps, like a musical instrument, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? So he's saying even a musical instrument, if you just play a bunch of random notes, people don't know what you're playing. They won't recognize the tune maybe, or it doesn't even sound good. He's saying it's the same when people say things that nobody understands. For of the trumpet given uncertain sounds, and now it's the instrument where they call people to battle. Who shall prepare himself to the battle? So even in war times, they have specific trumpet blows to rally the troops. And he's saying if that trumpet blow is not distinct, it's not made for a certain reason, people understand why it's being, why it's being sounded, nobody's going to rally themselves and know what the message is. So likewise ye, so in the same way, except ye utter, you speak by the tongue, words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? So this is where we as well need to apply this to soul winning when we try and preach the gospel. Don't just think, oh, you know, I just, I just ought to give my testimony and just say some things and just, you know, God's going to use that. No, no, no. The Bible's saying here, it matters what you, how you say things. You need to utter by the mouth, by the tongue, words easy to be understood. Right? That's something we need to strive for because you not thinking about how you 
articulate things, how you explain things, you grow in that knowledge so that you can be articulate, you'll, you will be like a trumpet giving an uncertain sound. And you go soul winning and you wonder why people don't get you. You know, you can't just be, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not trying to put you down if you struggle with this. I'm just saying you need to purpose to grow in that area, get better. Don't just have this mentality like, oh, it's just how I am and people are just going to have to, God's just going to have to use it. No, because God can use it even better if you as well purpose in your heart to improve how you communicate. How shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. So that's what's happening when people speak in tongues in church. They're just speaking to nobody. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them with, is without signification. What does that mean? He's just saying there's a lot of different sounds in the world and voices, but none of them is without meaning. Even animals, right? Like, you know, whales is one of them that, that you know, Finding Nemo is joking about where it's like, they, you know, like Dory's like, you know, talking to the whales and going like, like and you see it's just like this moaning. But hey, there's some meaning to that. That's, that's sort of the joke that they're showing. Like every animal has these meanings in how they communicate. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. So Paul is saying, if I go into a church and everyone's just speaking in a language that I don't know, I'm just going to think these, these are a bunch of barbarians. Now, when you see the word barbarian in the Bible, don't think of Conan the barbarian, like a warrior. Because you probably think barbarian is like Conan the barbarian, like big guy, strong, you know what? So barbarian in the Bible is just like a native, sort of uncivilized person, right? So we see in Acts 28 when Paul, you remember, he was shipwrecked and he was in the deep and then they came onto the island. Acts 28 says, and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. So they were like the, the natives there. They say they were shipwrecked. They came to shore, but the natives were actually kind to them and kindled a fire. And that's when Paul was actually bit by a snake. And, and he, he didn't immediately, he was bit by a venomous snake. If you haven't read these stories, now he's got to read them, guys. Like sometimes people start reading Acts and they get to Acts, and then they're like Acts, you know, 16, 17. And then you never get to like Acts 28. And you read about these interesting stories and you're like, oh, I didn't even know that Acts, the way Acts 28 ends when Paul's just, you know, prisoned in his house and no man for visits. It's like, did you know that that's how Acts ends? It's, it's really weird. So Acts 28. So anyways, this story is they're shipwrecked. He goes onto the island. They're, they're gathering sticks to kindle a fire. A viper, a snake comes out of the, the, the wood and bites, um, bites Paul, right? And then all the barbarous people are like, well, he didn't die from that bite. So then they think he's God, right? They think he's a God. He didn't die. Well, it's because he's an apostle. And one of the signs that would follow them that believe is that they, you know, they would drink poison. and they, So that's why he didn't die. <clears throat> so it's like God's using Paul there to reach these barbarous people. So when it says, I shall be unto him that speaketh of a barbarian, it's saying like, well, I don't know what these guys are saying, these natives. Like sometimes... Like in Australia, if you, if you speak to an Aboriginal when they first came here, it's like, you don't know what they're saying. That's what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 14. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. So it's like, hey, it's great that you're passionate about getting spiritual gifts, but even more so, I want you to be passionate about building up the church. And there's no point speaking in an unknown language. If nobody understands you, nobody can be edified. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now, I just want to address verse 14 because I believe this is where they get this idea that when I pray in this angelic language, then I just pray, my spirit is praying. You know, saying, I don't know what I'm praying, I'm just praying. And I just, but my understanding is unfruitful. Same like, then saying, see, Paul prays in an unknown tongue. His spirit praying, but my understanding is unproven. Now, this is, I don't think this is what Paul is saying, right? Because it doesn't make sense for what he said already that you would just say things and have no idea what you're talking about. So what is he saying here when he says, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now, remember the context of this is people speaking in a tongue that they've been given, but nobody else understands. Now, what I believe he's saying here is he it's like, have you ever prayed with somebody that speaks a different language? I have before, because I used to go to a church that had Chinese people. And sometimes, and I don't understand all of Chinese. 
And sometimes we get these international students and then they come, you know, and, and sometimes we'd have combined meetings where we would pray with people that didn't speak English, they spoke Chinese, and we'd just say, well, it doesn't matter, just speak in your language. You know, because obviously we don't want to discourage them from praying. So they just come and they just pray. They pray in Chinese, but not everyone, but you just wait for the Amen, right? <laughs> so you're just like praying with them and you don't know what they're saying, but, you, but this is what Paul is saying. He's like, my spirit's praying, but my understanding's unfruitful, right? So it's not ideal. This is not what should be done in church. Like you'd never get somebody in Chinese speak and pray to the church. Those prayer meetings were just, we were grouped in pairs or threes and things like that. This is what I think he's talking about, right? Because when you read in verse 15, he says, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. So when he says, what is it then? He's saying, well, how should it be then? Right? What is it then? He's saying, well, then what, how should it be? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding. So this is saying, this is how it should be. You should pray in the Spirit, but you should also pray understanding what you pray. I will sing with the Spirit. So not only do you pray with the understanding, he's saying sing in the Spirit, you also sing with the understanding also. And verse 16 is the clue that I think what Paul is talking about. He says, Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned, right, people that don't know the language, say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. So you see what he's saying here? So when he's saying here in verse 14, my spirit praying but my understanding is unfruitful, is because when you're praying in the church, you want to pray with them, but you don't know what they're talking about. And that's why he says in verse 16, see, when somebody blesses in an unknown tongue, your spirit's praying with them, but you don't know what they're talking about. How is somebody meant to say amen if they have no idea what you're saying? All right, so maybe I shouldn't have been saying amen with those Chinese people because I had no idea what they were saying. I should just be like, Jesus' name, amen. It's like, all right. Um, Seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. Let's continue. So that's what I think Paul is talking about. He's not talking about speaking in an angelic language. He has no idea, but his spirit's praying. His understanding's unfruitful. No, he's saying he wants to be able to pray with the prayers that are going on in church, in this congregation, like when we pray together, but if it was in an unknown tongue, you couldn't say amen because you don't know what's being said. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. See, so even though you're praying in tongues, he's not saying... He's not saying sinful is a bad job he's just saying well, nobody is edified by it it's not ideal i thank my god i speak with tongues more than ye all see so paul he knew that he spoke with tongues that's why he knew that they were abusing these things look at this yet in the church so the church is when we're assembled here like now everyone's expected to be here we're assembled everyone's attention is here in the church i had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also. Look at this. Then 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Now, are Pentecostals following that? I mean, Pentecostals, I mean, I don't know how many thousands of words they mutter in this angelic language. But Paul is saying here, hey, I would rather you, I just say five words in English than 10,000 words in whatever language you think that is, right? Like, no, in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding. That by my voice I might teach others also, than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Brethren, so he kind of changes course here, but it's still related. He says, be not children in understanding. What is he saying here? When it comes to understanding Bible doctrine, understanding the preaching, understanding what's going on in church, he's saying we shouldn't be children in that area. We, sh we have to understand. That's why it's no point preaching in an unknown tongue when nobody understands. You're basically keeping people as children. But then he, you know, then he, he sort of says something related to that. He says, how be it in malice be ye children? He's saying, hey, there are some areas in the Christian life where you should be like a child, and one of them is how you hate people. Right? When you have mal intent to other people, that's where you should be like a child, where you don't harbor bitterness, harbor malice, harbor revenge in your heart to other people because children don't do that. You know, children, you know, they, you know, one time, you know, they, they're hating on their brother and the next minute they're best friends playing to each other. That's what God wants his children to be like when it comes to malice. But in understanding, be men, be adults when it comes to understanding things. And that's why it's so important that preaching is done in a way where people can understand it. 
In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. So this is where he's now segueing into why tongues were given. Because now he's referencing an Old Testament scripture and saying, hey, the gift of tongues is the fulfillment that with, other, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, for yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. So people are given tongues, right? This miracle happens, but yet Jews still don't believe, right? They still didn't believe. Um, it says here in verse 22, so he goes on from that thought. This is why it's given. This is one of the things, and, and you know, to show, hey, even though this miracle happens, people aren't still believing. But he says, oh, uh, I guess God's people are still not believing. That's what I think it's referring to. Verse 22, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe, not but for them which believe. What is he saying there? He's saying the reason why tongues are given, it's to help unbelievers understand the gospel. Right? It's a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But oftentimes in Pentecostal churches, it's used as a sign to the believers to show them, hey, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm saved. That's why I'm speaking with tongues. You see how the Bible's saying here, no, no, this gift... This sign is not there for the benefit of believers. It's there for the benefit of unbelievers. Now think about it. If it's for the benefit of unbelievers and unbelievers don't believe in an angelic language and the Holy Ghost, how is that benefiting them? If you're speaking in a language, they have no idea. It's an angelic language. It's, they look like a barbarian to them. And yet the Bible says it's a sign for that person. It's because that's not how tongues are. right? Tongues are languages. They're not this angelic language like we see in the Pentecostal church. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, look at this, will they not say that ye are mad, you're crazy? Right? So it's not mad as in angry, you know, say like I'm really mad, angry, no. This is you're, you're mad as in you are insane. And that's why when you go to a Pentecostal church, and you see them speaking in the supposed angelic language. You do think you guys are crazy. You see them, if you've gone to one of them, and you see them like giggling and rolling around on the floor, you just think, this cannot be. I remember when I was not a believer, and I, I was invited to a charismatic church, even as an unbeliever, my brother was explaining this chapter to me as an unbeliever. I was just like, that makes complete sense, that this is not of God. You know, how does that even make sense? Especially when he said to me, and this was before I was saved. You know, he was saying to me, do you see the Bible saying here, it's for people that are unbelievers, not for believers. But if all prophesy and they come in one, they come in. So he's saying now, if people are preaching in a language that is understood, and they come in one that believeth not, one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. So you see a believer, uh, sorry, an unbeliever, see, he that one that they come in, one that believes not, an unbeliever should be able to sit in church and listen to the preaching and understand what is being preached. Not come to church and just think, these guys are nuts. I have no idea what's going on. You know, it's speaking in an unknown language. He is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest and so falling down on his face he will worship god and report that god is in you of a truth see the word of god is preached and it's preached with words easy to be understood even an unbeliever should be able to sit in here and go that makes sense right how is it then brethren when you come together every one of you have the psalm have the doctrine have the tongue have the revelation have an interpretation let all be let all things be done unto edifying so now he says hey when people come you know this is not saying he's not saying here because i've always read this a different way but you know and i'm studying this out it's like oh man i i don't think i've understood this the right way because he, he's not saying here he's not saying here like how, how he's not saying how is it that everyone's just coming with a revelation as is like this shouldn't be the case like everyone has a revelation right what he's saying here is 
when he says, how is it then, brethren? He's not questioning, like, how? Because when we read that in, in, in modern English, we're thinking, like, we would read it as, and I don't know if you've read it like this too, it's like, how is everyone coming to church and just has a revelation and a psalm and a doctrine? It's like, it's just like, everyone's just got something from God that they want to share. I mean, that is what he's saying, right? Because this is the early church where there's prophets there, you know, there's maybe apostles coming. And, but he's not saying, how did this happen? Which is how I've always read it. Like, how is it that you all have a psalm, has a doctrine? What he's, when he says, how is it then, brethren? He's, he's saying, how should it be then? Because remember when we read earlier, he says, what... What is it then? So that's saying, what should it be? Like, what is it then? Like, what is, what is it? It's like, how should it be then? And what he's saying here is, how is it then? So how should it be? How is it then? Not, how is it then? Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? So that's what he's saying. So he's saying, how should it be, brethren, when you come together? Because now he's talking about confusion in the church because there's just people speaking in unknown language. So he's saying, no, 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 God wants edification. He wants people to be edified, understand. So he's saying, so then how should it be, brethren? When you all come, you all have something to say. You know, you have something that's revealed by God and you want to share it with the church. How should it be done? He's saying, let all things be done unto edifying. So whether it's a song that says, so whether somebody comes with a song that they want to sing to the congregation, whether somebody has a doctrine that they want to teach, somebody might have a tongue, right? But then what, what did we learn in 1 Corinthians 14? If somebody has a tongue, there needs to be an interpreter, right? Hath a revelation, something revealed to them, an interpretation of something. He's saying, hey, there's all these things that can edify the body. And he's saying, that's how we gear it. We gear it so that the church is edified. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Right? So Paul is not saying, hey, I'm not forbidding people to speak with tongues. He's just saying, hey, but if you speak with tongues, you don't have an interpreter, then you don't speak to the church in a tongue without an interpreter. We're almost there. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And I agree with this. You know, some people say, well, when you come to church, it doesn't always have to be one person doing all the preaching. I, I don't have a problem with that. You know, if there are other people preaching, you know, I've offered to some of the guys to say, hey, prepare something for 10 minutes, prepare something shorter, and we'll preach a bit shorter. We'll share the preaching time. So th that I don't have a problem with. And I think that's what the, I don't think this is teaching because when it says, let the prophets speak two or three, this is not just a church sitting in a circle and just like everybody just gets to say something. That's not, that's not what it is. And that's what some people who have the Korah mentality of just, there aren't leaders in church, there aren't preachers in church, there aren't teachers in church that you know, meet some qualifications and have some level of knowledge to teach the church, they just want everyone to just be equal, right? And then you have a church where it says, let's just all sit in a circle, we just read the passage, and what do you think? What, what, do, you, what do you think, Simon? What do you think that means? You know, of, you know, of course we're not going to have you know, children and women, which is what we're going to talk about later, teaching the church because it's a position for men and it's a position for men. These, these are the prophets that he's talking about in the early church in Corinth. Speak by two or three. So it's not just like free for all either. There's some order that's happening here in the early church. But it doesn't always have to just be one speaker. And I, I'm, I'm fine with that. And we've had multiple people speak at this church before. And I would like more people to, to preach. You know, this is something that I want you guys to grow to and that we can, we, don't, we can share this ministry. It's not just my ministry. Let the prophet speak two or three. Let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one, and all may learn, and all may be confident. So I don't think this is saying everyone. I'm just saying, I just think it's like over the course of when they meet, everyone gets an opportunity, but it says two or three, right, at the time. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So this is another reason why I believe the Pentecostal movement have it wrong. 
Because when they speak with tongues, they're not under control. A lot of them will even testify that the Holy Spirit just overcame them and they couldn't control themselves. They're like giggling and shaking uncontrollably. You know, some of them even go so crazy as to like barking like animals and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. But the Bible says here, no, 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 everything's done unto edifying. Everything's done decently in order. We speak one by one. And when people speak by the Spirit of God, they are subject to it. They, they are in control, right? The spirits of the prophet, the spirit of that prophet is subject to the prophet. For God is not the author of confusion, because he's talking about confusion in terms of things out of order, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Now, just something just short on, and I know this is a long sermon, hopefully you guys are enjoying this, but God is not the author of confusion. I just want to touch on this because some people read God is not the author of confusion and they take that passage and just think, any doctrine that's hard to understand just can't be a biblical doctrine. Have you ever heard people use this passage like this? So they'll say things like, you know, for example, the Trinity. Three, one, that's how I understand it, right? Three persons, one person. And they'll say like, well, that can't be a biblical doctrine because it's just, it's just too hard to understand, right? It's just confusing. So, and the Bible says your God is not the author of confusion. Now, I think this passage has been used a lot out of context because the context is the confusion that's happening at church with people speaking in tongues and things not in order. So what he's teaching here, if he says God is not the author of confusion, it's that if the church is not run decently and in order and things done under edifying and people if they speak in tongues as an interpreter and people speak one by one, they're not just interrupting each other, you know, they're, they're, there's some order there. He's saying that's not of God because that's not, it's like when we talk about unity in the church. If there's a lot of conflict and strife happening in the church, it's because the Holy Spirit is not there working amongst the people, keeping people unified. It's not of God. Just like when there's confusion and you know, things like that, what we read about in a church, it's not of God. It doesn't mean that just because there's a doctrine that's hard to understand that that is not of God. Now, I'm not saying that every doctrine that is hard to understand is of God either. I'm just saying that's not one way you judge whether a doctrine is right. You judge whether a doctrine is right by whether the Bible teaches it. If it doesn't, then it's not of God. If it is, then it is of God. But just because it's hard to understand doesn't mean it's not of God. Look at what it says here in 2 Peter 3. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Look at this. So Peter is talking about the letters that Paul has written. And look at what he says about Paul's letters. As also in all his epistles, so letters, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, right? They, they wrestle with them as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So there are some things that are so hard to be understood that un, like, you know, these unlearned and unstable, they get so confused that they... Get, you know, get out of the faith or uh, you know, start believing heresy or stuff like that. So just because something is hard to be understood, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not of God. I just wanted to make that point because so there are some doctrines that are not easy to understand. All right, we're almost there. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. I thought I would touch on this just because it's in this chapter, and I thought, well, I'm preaching on tongues. I'm just going to go through this chapter and finish it. So in 1 Corinthians 14, one teaching we get here that's very clear in the Bible, that women are to keep silence in churches. Now, a lot of people misunderstand what it means for a woman to keep silence in church. So I just want to explain this to you so you don't get the wrong idea. Because when you hear women keep silence in church, you know, some people just think, well, can a woman not say anything? You know, just sit there, quiet. No, no, that doesn't make sense because women are, are expected to sing. Right? So what, when the Bible says that women should keep silence in church for it is not permitted unto them to speak, what is it talking about? Is it talking about, you know, women aren't even allowed to make, you know, aren't allowed to laugh. They have to be careful if they shuffle a bit too loud. You know, you can't tell your child off and say, hey, Simon, sit still. You know, the husband has to do that because a woman has to keep silence in church. No, because, you know, you should sing and things like that in church. You know, you can laugh. 
Um, I don't think women should be saying amen, though, because this is what I believe the Bible is talking about. If you think about the context of 1 Corinthians 14, what is it talking about? It's talking about edifying and speaking to the church. So that's what the Bible is talking about. When the Bible says that women should keep silence in the church, it doesn't mean you can't talk after the fellowship, you can't ask questions, you can't have conversation with people, you can't, once you come to church, you walk through those doors, you're in the, it's just like, you can't say hello, you, know, you just walk behind your husband. No, 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 it's saying women are not permitted to address the church, like I'm addressing now. This is what the Bible's talking about. That's why in our church, we don't have women pray. We don't have women sing a special to the church. You sing congregationally. We don't have women pray. We don't have women read the Bible. We don't have women preach, right? And women should not be bishops and deacons either, um, like in the world we see today. Women are meant to keep silence in the church. It's a man's job in the church because God wants to maintain the hierarchy that men are in charge, right? And women follow. So that's how it is at church as well. Women keep silence when it comes to the address of the church and women are never to address the congregation as a whole congregation. Now we see this in 1 Timothy 2 where we get an idea. See, it's not just they're just silent completely. It says, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. So you remember the, the context of 1 Corinthians 14 is women addressing the church, teaching, edifying the church. That's what God doesn't want. And that's why when the Bible says, let the women learn in silence, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, what are they speaking? They're speaking like, let the prophets speak, one or two. Right? The teachers speaking, they're not just speaking, you know, after the meeting's over and we're just sort of fellowshipping or we're having dinner. It's when they address the congregation. Let the woman, 1 Timothy 2, learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer, I don't allow, the Bible says, not a woman to teach. So you see there, it's learn in silence, to teach. The speaking is the edifying of the church. Nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, it's not to say that you never have authority over a man. I think what this is saying is, in principle, men are in charge at church. Women should not be in charge. So it's not that women never uh, have an authority over men, but I just don't think women are in charge. So you might say, hey, you have a, an event that you're organizing and some men help, and in that sense, you've got some authority because you've got people that are helping you. But you're not in charge of the church because you still have men in charge of you making sure that it's done according to God's word. So it's not that there can't be children that you're over. You know, so you might have a ministry where you play games for children. It's like, okay, a woman, if she's organizing games, well, then none of the boys can play. It's only girls because you can't usurp authority over a man, right? Over a, 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 a man child even, or a youth. No, I just think this is what it's teaching here is, hey, when you learn in silence, in the address of the congregation, women are not in charge. Men are in charge. Men teach and men edify the church. And that's why the Bible's saying here, let the woman learn in silence. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So this is why I don't believe women during the preaching should say amen. You know, women during the teaching, during the Bible reading, during the prayer, they should just be silent and listen, right? And let the men speak. Now, when it comes to congregational singing, that's different because everybody's singing. The church is not being addressed from one place. It's just everyone singing together. That's why that's different. But a few other questions, because I know this is probably raising some questions in your mind, because people have asked me these things before, and uh, I just thought I would mention it because it's in this chapter. But what people ask me about is in verse 35. Right? You're probably wondering about verse 35. They're commanded, under, they're commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the Lord. Verse 35. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So I've already addressed what I believe it's talking about when women speak in the church. It's not talking about just general conversation amongst people, like women can't talk afterwards, or even you can't even talk to men afterwards. It's talking about women addressing the church, like I'm addressing the church now. Now, here's my thoughts on verse 35. A lot of people have read verse 35, and they think, yeah, you say that it's just women addressing the church, but the Bible seems to indicate here that women shouldn't be talking at all until they get home. Because the Bible says here, hey, if you want to learn anything, 
you got to ask your husband at home. So can you then go to a brother in Christ afterwards and say, hey, I, you know, come to me even. And maybe a lady will come to me and say, hey, can you just clarify what you were saying? Or they'll go to somebody else. I didn't really understand what Victor was preaching. You know, is that what you thought? Is that, you know, getting, asking questions, even giving an opinion and saying, oh, is that what, maybe it's this? You know, just general discussion. Is this what this is outlawed? I don't believe so, right? Because, like I said, when it talks about addressing the church, this is what it's talking about. You're sitting in it right now where the church is assembled and, and the church is being addressed. That's what it's condemning for a woman. Now, when this assembly is broken up, right, and we start talking in little groups, some people go back there and, you know, not everyone stays around. I don't believe that's what this, that the church is talking about anymore. Like when it talks about keeping silence in the church, it's not just talking about just people in general. Because if you can't talk afterwards, when does the church stop? You know, like if you meet somebody later on down the week and you're both part of the church, I mean, you're meant to keep silence too because you're both part of the church. But what, when are you in church? When are you out of church? Right now where I'm sitting is, my position is, what, what you're sitting in right now is church. When you're called together, you're at attention, there's an address, there's singing, and then eventually this address stops. Right? It's the same at dinner, right? At dinner, the address has stopped. Not everyone sticks around. Not everyone, you know, it's not a sin if you forsake the the, the dinner um, and there's just general conversation that's just going on in different parts of the table that's different to everyone at attention listening to edifying listening to preaching or listening to prayer so what do i believe this is talking about what i think this is talking about is if, if we read if we think about the context of first corinthians 14 it's people that have a have something to contribute to the edification of the church right? people come they have a psalm they have a doctrine they have some preaching and men in that address to the church are preaching and edifying the church. But what I think this is saying is sometimes a woman will have a revelation from God, right? She'll learn something from the scriptures. She'll have something that is to, that can benefit the edifying of the church. But how does she then share that with the church? This is why I think it's saying, hey, if you learn anything, that means you get some knowledge or some revelation from your own bible reading or something and it's something that's beneficial it's saying hey that's when you would speak to your husband at home you'd ask him about it at home and you know you can get that initial verification so people will say well what if i don't have a husband right like some because I, I think this is talking about the ideal scenario the ideal scenario is that people marry young they're marrying a believer they have a husband that's leading the home that's what i believe this is referring to so i think by extent this is my opinion by extension, that means, you know, maybe if you don't have a husband, but you've got a saved brother, you know, you can check. It's basically saying, hey, check with somebody privately. It's not for you as a woman to say, hey, I've got something to edify the church. Can I speak? Can I, you know, during the announcement, say this and share my knowledge with the church? No, it needs to be channeled through the men so that, like God has it in the church, that men are the ones that speak and are in authority at church. So that's what I believe it's talking about. And that's why I think it says, let them ask their husbands at home. And then there's the four. Why? Because, so why if you learn anything, you ask your husband at home? Because it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Right? So it's not saying that you just general conversation because the, the women, remember the speaking at church is the address. And I know I'm just driving this point forward. I'm just hoping you guys understand what I'm saying. So it's the speaking in church, you're saying, for it's a shame for a woman to speak in the church. Because she cannot edify the church directly, it goes through the other channels, right? If she learns something, ask it about your husband or a brother, or even if you don't have saved family and friends, that's when you might approach the men here and say, hey, I, this is something I learned, I think this might help people. And that happens, do you know that? A lot of, sometimes the stuff in my sermons comes from my wife. Where she, you know, she'll get something from God and she thinks, hey, this is, a, she talks to me about it. Is this something that's biblical? And I say, hey, that's good. And then I include it in my sermon. So it works like that amongst other people too. Like, you know, like maybe Edna gets something. She spoke, speaks to Lewis and then Lewis talks to me about it. Or maybe Lewis, in mean, his preaching, you know, if he gets to preach one day, is he shares something that was actually revealed to Edna. You know what I'm saying? So this is what I believe this is talking about. This is how women contribute to the edifying of the church they channel it through the men who are in authority and then they are the gatekeepers of what actually gets taught to the church 
So a couple other things as well, because I just want to address this too. But sometimes people will ask me, so I already said, hey, it's about the preaching, the praying, singing, reading. I already said amens, I don't think are, are right. And it's not just talking about general noise when it talks about women keeping silence, you know, calming your children down, you know, bodily noises, you know, laughing, that sort of stuff. Now, one thing people ask me is, I've had somebody ask me this, what about social media groups? Right? Because I've had people say to me before, they have a problem with women commenting in social media groups. And that's, that's, that's always an interesting question. I honestly had never thought about it. I've thought about it, now I'm going to share with you my thoughts. Right? Social media groups. So say, for example, we've got a church WhatsApp channel. You know, is, is a woman allowed to comment in that WhatsApp channel and tell people what they think? It's like, hey, they're addressing the whole church. Or a Facebook group. You know, we've got a Facebook group. You can post that. People will post questions. And people will discuss on there. If you're not on Facebook and you want to be in the Facebook group, just let me know. Um, but people discuss things on there. We post things that are happening, and, and, that's, uh, and I really like uh, how Facebook works in that, in that instance. And people will say, well, should women be posting things? Because if a woman posts something in the Facebook group, is she speaking to the church? Because you know, we live in a technological age now. It's, you know, back then, it's, you had to speak to a congregation. But now, you know, electronically, you can speak to the whole congregation. Now, why don't I think WhatsApp or Facebook groups is church? Well, this is what I said to this individual that was sort of challenging me on this and saying, hey, you shouldn't let women comment in these channels and comment on Facebook. I was, I was saying, well, first thing I said to them was, well, if that's church, if the Facebook group is church, then your, your wife needs a Facebook account, right? Because if your wife is not on Facebook, then she's forsaking the assembly. Right? Whereas a church, you know, it's not like you just come to church and your wife doesn't go to church. If Facebook group and WhatsApp is church, why aren't the children in the Facebook group? So that's why I draw a line between social media groups and church. Because church, men, their wives, their children are expected to be here. If you forsake this gathering you are forsaking the assembly. You're in sin. But if you say, you know what? I don't want Facebook spying on me and all that sort of stuff, right? And you say, I'm not going to be part of the Facebook group because you're not in sin, because it's not church. You don't have to be part of the Facebook group. If somebody says, I don't want to install WhatsApp, then you know you have to install it. You're not in sin. It just, just makes it difficult to communicate with everyone, right? So it's the same thing. So that's how I see it. So that's how I see social media groups. And you already understand what I think about dinner table conversation because this, if I, that's where I draw the line. This address here where everyone's expected to be here and if you're not here, you're forsaking the assembly. That is what we're talking about when we're talking about in church. Not one-on-one -on -one conversation, not the greeting, not you know, a conversation over dinner, not text messaging. You know, and women think like, oh, if I can't text message in the church group, should I create like a women's only group and things like that? You know, this is like adding, you know, commandments to the Bible that don't need to be there, right? All right, let's finish off. What came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So Paul is saying here that nobody has a monopoly on Bible knowledge, right? It's, it's, but, he's, but you have to acknowledge that what comes from the apostles is God's commandment. If any be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. So desire that you can prophesy. And don't forbid to speak with tongues. Forbid not to speak with tongues. And then he finishes 1 Corinthians 14 with, let all things be done decently and in order. So that's what 1 Corinthians 14 is about. about everything being in order at church, to edification, who can speak at church, how they're meant to speak. And I hope that gives you a bit more understanding when it mentions that women keep silence in the church. It's not that women are not allowed to say anything. It's that it's not their place to lead the church. It's not their place to teach the church or address the church. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord. Um, thank you for what we've learned today, just about speaking with tongues. Uh, I pray, Lord, that we would never be drawn away with the practice of the Pentecostals and how they just speak in this gibberish Lord, help us to know what the Bible says about these, uh, this, this gift, the speaking with tongues. 
so that we're not fooled by uh, this, this, these movements that are out there claiming to be of the Holy Ghost. So thank you, Lord, that, you know, with the movement that is so big, you've given us a whole chapter with so many points where people have just gone off the rails on it. So, Lord, I thank you that your word gives us this knowledge to keep us on the right track so that, Lord, help us at church to have everything done always decently and in order unto edifying. And I pray, Lord, that this church will never have women in charge, women preachers, women leaders. Lord, help us to always keep your word as it is and value the places that you had us and value that men preach and women take care of the home not because it's oppressive lord but because it's what's best and when people go against that grain all sorts of problems become created and a lot of false doctrine he pre uh, creeps into the church so protect us from this lord help us to take a hard stand and help us to understand why it's important we love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.